All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Inside Writing. This show is presented by Gotham Writers, offering writing classes of all types and sizes. You can visit us online at GothamWriters.com. Before we get started, a couple of announcements. Uh, first, the Gotham Writers Conference is open for registration. So whether you have a project you want to pitch to agents or you just want to peek behind the publishing curtain, this is the place to be. You can see more information on that on the Gotham Writers website as well. Secondly, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. And you can get caught up on all of our previous seasons and episodes on the Gotham Writers YouTube channel or on any major podcasting platform. And while you're there, be sure to like us, subscribe, leave a review. It helps to spread the word. Okay, regarding today, at any point in the show, reminder, you can uh, pose your questions for the Q&A portion using that Q&A button on your Zoom dashboard. So people, most of you probably know the lay of the Zoom land, but for those of you who don't, uh, on the bottom of your Zoom dashboard, there's a Q&A button. Uh, that's where you can pose your questions. Uh, you, there's also a chat down there. That's just for general discussion among, uh, among attendees. So make sure you, if there's a question you wanna ask in the discussion, make sure you put it in the Q&A down there. So on to the conversation for today. Today, we're gonna be talking with another inside writing veteran, Ken Liu. Ken is a Hugo Nebula and World Fantasy Award-winning author of science fiction and fantasy. His story, The Paper Menagerie, is the first to win all three awards. He's also the author of the Dandelion Dynasty fantasy series and the short story collection, The Hidden Girl and Other Stories, as well as much, much more. He has had stories adapted on Netflix's Love, Death, and Robots, as well as AMC Plus's Pantheon. Hello, Ken. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Josh. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're going to start with where it all started for you. So you, you've had such a storied career in writing, but where did it all begin for you? What was that first creative spark that sort of kicked off this journey for you? Um, you know, I mean, I, I can tell you a, a very polished story about how you know I always wanted to write and I always wanted to be creative, but um, that's, that's not really true. Um, I sort of stumbled into it. I mean, um, I did always want to have a career in the arts, um, but that was not how I, uh, I didn't aim myself in that direction. Um, I started out as a computer programmer uh, and then went to work as a lawyer uh, and then eventually as a forensic uh, data scientist. Uh, but throughout that process over a period of 20 years or so, uh, I just kept on writing and publishing. I got to the point where I actually, um, it was, it made more sense for me to write full time than to do the day job. Um, so it just happened that way. Uh, it wasn't because of some grand drive. I just kept at it uh, and eventually worked out. Mm -hmm. And speaking of, of other work you've done, like you said you, you did data scientist, you were a lawyer. When did you find time to, I mean, those sound like time, time consuming jobs. When did you find time to write during all that? You know, um, I, I think everyone is different. Uh, this is one of those process things. Uh, I tended to um, do my best work by finding time between the full-time job, you know, finding little nooks and crannies of time to squeeze that stuff in. I think most of you who are working full-time at some job other than writing can relate to this, but you seem to be more creative when you are working at a full-time job that you have just a few little snippets of time you can find during the day. Um, that's what happened to me. I, I wrote a lot of my um, fiction on the commute, on the commuter rail uh, from where I lived in the suburbs into the city. Um, I had about uh, an hour and a half every day of commuting time. So I just used that to write. And then I also wrote during my lunch break when I took a lunch break. Um, that's pretty much how I did it. Um, and, you know, you'd be surprised at how much you get done if you, uh, you know, can find that time on a daily basis to, to work at it. Um, so, though I will say finding the mental space to dedicate of work was an issue. Um, when I was working on, uh, for example, when I was working as a forensic data scientist and there's some big case going on, I really couldn't find the mental energy to work on anything. Um, so um, during those times, I just had to focus. Mm -hmm. and, and do you feel like your jobs, and because I mean, it sounds like a lot of the work you did was in the science field and you happened to write science fiction. I know, you know, we'll talk more about genre labels later on, but do you feel like you drew any inspiration from your job? Did they help you at all? 
Oh, for sure. Um, I mean, a lot of, if you read my fiction, there are two recurring concerns. One of them is with the idea of technology, what technology is in the broadest sense. Uh, and by technology, I, I don't mean just computers and rockets. I mean, things like the way um, we organize society, uh, language itself, uh, writing systems. Uh, these are all forms of technology. And working in the technology field, and especially uh, in uh, patent litigation, uh, gave me a lot of practice and insight into the history of technology. Uh, which is, you know, a, a fascinating, wonderful field. So a lot of my story ideas and a lot of my recurring concerns do draw from that. The other uh, big recurring concern for me is um, uh, everything related to the law, from constitutions to legal systems to what does it mean to have justice? Uh, that's a recurring theme uh, in my fiction. Um, and that obviously draws from my uh, history as a, um, a lawyer. Uh, for many years. Uh, so there's no doubt that these these day jobs uh, became a very important part of my identity and a very important part of, of my fiction. So at what point in these day jobs, because you had to make that choice at some point to move to being a full-time writer. At what point did you decide that? Was it just when you had all these projects and not enough time to do them? Or, or when did that transition happen for you? Yeah, that's basically how it happened. Um, it got to the point where I had so many writing projects that it no longer made sense to be working at two jobs. Um, uh, it, it, I mean, that's what it was. And I always wanted to spend more time uh, with my kids. Um, and I was like, this is kind of silly. I, I don't know why I'm doing two jobs at once when I don't need to. Um, you know, it got to the point where I could say, hey, I'm not going to be making lawyer money anymore, uh, but that's okay. I, I, I have this other job that I enjoy a lot uh, and that uh, will make enough uh, for me to uh, make a living. And I'm going to do that. Uh, and I feel very lucky to be able to actually make that choice. I mean, it took me 20 years to get there. So, you know, this is not, um, I, I don't know if you would call this a, a really inspiring success story because <laughs> it took so long, uh, but I did eventually get there. Uh, and I had fun along the way. Um, so I'm pretty happy and I feel very lucky. Mm -hmm. So you, correct me if I'm wrong, you started writing short stories. It was that you started in the short story sphere and, and you know, kind of building on your, your development as a writer, you know, you started with short stories. When did you start going into a novel? Where were you as a writer when you started writing longer form projects? You know, by the time I started writing my first novel, this is very unusual, I think, uh, for writers these days, but, um, I had written and published, I think, over a hundred short stories by the time I started writing a novel. I don't think that's very typical. I think most novelists actually start out writing novels these days. Uh, that was not my case. I, I, I just didn't. Um, but I, I did want to write a novel. I just never found a subject that was interesting to me. Uh, and then uh, about 10 years into my career as a short story writer, I suddenly thought, you know, I like to try to delve into a world more deeply and to tell a longer story than what I'm used to. Um, and it's always fun to try something new. Um, I felt like I got a good handle on the different types of short stories I could write. I could keep on experimenting with form, but I also thought it might be fun to explore writing a very long thing. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad that I, I did make that. Uh, choice because, uh, you know, the novel series, the Dungeon, the Dungeon of Dynasty, turned out to be by far my favorite thing I've ever written. Uh, it's also the longest thing I've ever written. <laughs> took me 10 plus years to actually write it. Um, and, you know, spending 10 plus years, spending such a large portion of your life, period, on anything. I mean, I've never spent that much of my life on anything other than raising my kids. Uh, but but this is this is this is cool. Um, it's, it's, it's very, it's very interesting to grow as a writer, as a person to take on a project like that. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, but it was not, I, I didn't start out with the idea that I would be a novelist. Um, it's just a thing I wanted to do to try. And, um, it turned out to be a really great experiment. I'm glad mm -hmm. I did it. What, what's also great about this series is you, you essentially came up with your own subgenre in it called silk punk, which I imagine this wasn't something you planned. At what point did you realize, oh, this is kind of its own thing? Well, you know, I mean, there's no 
um, there, there was no doubt that whatever I ended up writing was going to be my own thing because writers can't help it. They, they, they just end up always putting their own stamp on the stuff they try to do. Um, I wanted to write epic fantasy, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, my recurring concerns are one, technology, and two, uh, constitutionalism, I, I guess I would say. Or um, another way to put it is uh, collective storytelling because I think constitutions are actually not documents. They're collective stories that societies tell themselves, tell themselves about who they are. <laughs> and with these two recurring concerns, when I put them in an epic fantasy context, it becomes something a little bit unusual. Uh, not that other epic fantasies don't concern themselves with these things, but I don't think as many, uh, I personally have not read that many epic fantasies where the focus is so much on um, engineers as heroes rather than wizards and proper constitutions rather than just military strategy is the focus. Um, so I wanted to describe my books in a way that was accurate. Um, I ended up choosing soap punk to focus on the technology aspect because um, in the same way that steampunk is based on the technology aesthetics of uh, industrial revolution era Europe or England specifically, um, I wanted to um, see if I can do some kind of retro futurism based on the engineering practices of classical East Asia antiquity. So by taking that and, and the most important industrial material uh, for a lot of classical East Asian uh, engineering project was silk. It's a very unique material with a lot of strength, a lot of power and a lot of very unique uh, properties. Um, so since a lot of my uh, invented technologies in the fantasy um, series involve silk uh, and uh, a byproduct of silk, which is electricity. Um, and so I called it Silk Punk. That's, that's, that, that's where the name came from. Uh, and I wanted to just give people a, a very accurate sense of what it was actually about. Mm -hmm. So this seems like a good point to bring up. Uh, you know, you, you said you spent 10 years writing short stories before you went into looking for an, for or before you started writing a novel, at what point in this process did you start thinking about getting an agent? Or, uh, and actually this question just came up in the Q&A, so it's good timing. Uh, what point did you start pursuing an agent and what was that process like for you? Um, you know, getting an agent is always, always hard. Um, and um, my, I think if you ask 10 writers, they're gonna have 10 completely different experiences and journeys in getting their agents. Um, I'm super happy with my agent now. Um, and, uh, it, it, it took a long time to get there. So I'll, I'll recount the story, um, which is sort of an epic on its own. Um, I didn't go, um, uh, I was very intimidated by the whole idea of looking for an agent. Uh, and initially when I was just writing short stories, I didn't need an agent, uh, in the short story market, you handle everything yourself. Uh, and there's no, there's not enough money in the market, uh, unless you're, you know, super famous, uh, for an agent to be even involved. There's just not enough money. Agents can't possibly be bothered to do something like that. Um, so I was handling everything on my own, uh, and that was perfectly fine. Um, you know, I wasn't making a lot of money. It was, it was just a very fun side hustle. Um, and I enjoyed, uh, the work I could do. But eventually it got to the point where uh, I was thinking about putting out collections. And uh, at that point, traditionally, you do find an agent and you try to, um, uh, because, you know, you can get a book deal. That, at that point, agents would make sense. Um, it was very hard for me uh, because, again, I had to, uh, uh, I, I did all the typical stuff, you know, the query letters, the finding list of agents and, and try to figure out who would be a good match. Um, but I was always going to be very patient. Um, so um, I don't need to put out a collection right away. So I waited actually many years. Uh, some writers will put out a collection after, you know, four or five years once they've had maybe 10 or 20 stories. Um, I decided that I could afford to just wait. Uh, I wasn't in a rush. I, I didn't, I wasn't on any sort of deadline. If, if I needed to wait longer to put out my collection, so be it. So I just waited, waited, and waited. 
um, until it got to the point where I had so many stories out that I was able to basically make a little bit of name for myself. So that's the other way you can try to find an agent instead of going out and working really hard to to connect with an agent. Just build your own reputation, build your own career to the point where agents actually pay attention to you. That's essentially what happened to me. I, I was I was winning a bunch of awards and I had so many stories out that it was obvious that I could do a collection, but this was years beyond when that would have made sense. Um, and my first agent uh, actually approached me and uh, basically said, hey, uh, you know, I, I've been following your career for a while. Uh, I, I noticed that you don't actually have representation. So... Um, you know, do you want to talk and see if it's a good fit? Um, he was not the first to approach me, of course. Uh, I talked to multiple agents, uh, but he he and I just clicked. We we had a good personality fit and he could, his vision for how he wanted to package me made sense to me. And, and so we just connected that way. Uh, and he ended up being my first agent. Um, I thought I was set for life um, and, and things were going very well. And my first agent, uh, you know, was, was, was great. Um, but not too long after he became my agent, uh, while I was in the process of actually showing him my, uh, the manuscript for my first novel, uh, he sort of told me that actually I can't be your agent anymore. And, and he didn't tell me why. And I was sort of like, crushed because I was, I thought I was getting fired as a client and I didn't know what I did wrong. Uh, but he was very, he was very mysterious about it. It was very confusing to me. I didn't know what was going on. Um, it turns out uh, later on that he had been in negotiations to take on the job and he ended up becoming um, the executive editor for a new science fiction fantasy imprint, uh, which is why he could no longer be an agent. Uh, but he wasn't at liberty to tell me that at the time. Um, so, um, eventually he, um, uh, when he could disclose to me what was happening, he said, okay, so here's a deal, you know, I'm going off to be an editor now. I, I can't be an agent anymore, but I can recommend a bunch of people I respect in the field that, that you should try. Um, so that was how I ended up connecting with my second agent on his recommendation. I spoke with a whole bunch of agents and it was, you know, very, stressful trying to do all these interviews trying to impress them trying to explain to them what i do and and, and see if there's a connection um and i ended up with my current agent who is absolutely amazing it's it's a perfect fit you know my, my my new agent has just a great sense of aesthetics and business sense he is completely different from my first agent but just as good a fit i mean this is the other if, if there's a lesson to be learned from all of this, I, I guess what I want to tell you is it's not that scary to switch agents. I mean, it is scary. It was terrifying to me when I had to switch agents. Um, but switching agents happens all the time, whether it's because you no longer fit each other's you know, needs well or because things like you know your agent is taking on the job as, as an executive editor. Um, for whatever reason, you have to expect to switch agents in the same way you switch jobs. And it's no big deal. You, you try to treat it as an opportunity. You go and, and talk to people and you will end up finding a perfect match again. Um, there are many perfect matches, I think. Uh, you, you don't have to think like you, if you found one agent, you're, you, you can never find another one that's good. Uh, I ended up having two great agents. Um, and uh, so that's, that's my story in a nutshell. I went through this process of being very patient. Uh, you know, when I was looking and sending out query letters, it wasn't all that successful. So I just waited and was very patient and kept on building my career because when you're building your career and just getting published and slowly working the way at your novel, whatnot, that's all part of finding an agent because, you know, you're, you're growing, you're putting yourself out there. Either you will find the agent or the agent will find you. It's not, it's not, there's no one way to find an agent and you don't have to think like the process that they tell you where you send out a hundred query letters and wait for the next round. That's, that's one way of doing it. It's not the only way. Um, it took me a lot longer to find an agent than most people, I suppose. Uh, but I was very happy with the result. But you brought up and, and somebody mentioned this in the comments as well, you know, this theme of patience. And, and that's something that I feel like 
a lot of writers either don't have or don't know how to engage with well is this idea of okay i need to stop worrying about so much you know rushing it and just doing it properly is there a way that you are you just a naturally patient person or how did you keep yourself patient throughout all this well i mean i have to say that um it, it has to do with the way i structured my career you know i i know some of my colleagues were much more um focused if you will and dedicated they 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 don't they don't even have day jobs they just went straight away um, uh, into writing full-time I could never do that I was always by nature a very cautious plotting kind of person I I, I like to know I like to have security you know I I'm, I'm a big believer in Virginia Woolf's a room of one's own. You, you have to have security first before you can think about creativity. Um, maybe that's not a popular opinion, but that's the way I, I like to approach my life. So in some sense, um, I was never under pressure to do anything. I, I, I remember I said I, it took me 20 years to get to the point where I could make a living by writing. And it did not bother me that was the case. I found jobs that I enjoyed in the meantime. Uh, and it was perfectly fine that I had the day job to occupy me and, and to gather, you know, material, if you will, to live life, to raise a family while I was working away on my craft um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the other times. But because I wasn't under any kind of pressure, I, I didn't feel like I had to go out there and get a big publishing contract right away or anything like that. I could wait until the best opportunity came along. I didn't have to take the first offer. Um, you know, one thing I didn't mention earlier is there were multiple offers to do a collection for me during the time that I didn't have an agent. And I always said no. And for four or five years, publishers, small publishers came to me and said, hey, do you want to do a collection? And, you know, had I taken it, it would have been fine too. But I just said, you know what, it doesn't feel totally right to me. I'm just going to wait. Uh, and there are lots of other agents who came along and said, Hey, do you want to, uh, do you, do you want me to represent you when they felt like I had a book deal that, that, that they could make? Uh, and if it didn't feel right to me, I just said, no, I just, I, I, I said, you know, look, I'm not in a rush. I'm just going to wait until the best opportunity came along. So I'm curious because you mentioned twice now, you know, having multiple offers from agents and you know, that's something that I feel like for a lot of writers, they feel like they get an offer, they have to take it. Um, how, how did you know when an agent wasn't right for you? Um, okay. This is actually very, I think it's actually very easy in some sense and also very hard. Um, it's easy because the only thing you really need to know to pick the right agent is to know yourself really well. Uh, it's also really hard because it's very hard for people to be honest with themselves about what they want. Okay. So I'm a very flawed person and I know that, and I know my flaws very well. So I know myself very well. I know what will work for me and what would not. Um, for one thing, um, I'm not, I have a very, very specific um, vision for what I want to do. So I don't like editorial interventions not even from editors, much less from agents. So agents who are editorially editorially very interventionist, they're just not right for me. I always ask them, you know, how much do you give input into the manuscripts that your writers, you know, uh, hand you? And, uh, and you know, the, the answer is all over the place. Some agents are very editorially involved in their writer's work. They really take part in coaching and shaping that. And for some writers, that is the right thing. They want their agent to do that. I am not. I do not want my agent to tell me anything about how I want to write my work. Um, I'm going to write the work I want to write, and my agent is going to try to figure out the best way to sell it. They're free to give me some business advice. But on the whole, um, I, I don't want them to tell me what to write. I'm not interested in that. Uh, so you know, I know that I have this about me. So I know already right away what kind of agents I would never click and I would never work well with. So I just, I know no matter how famous they are, um, if they are the kind of agents who are editorially very interventionist, it's just not going to work. Not going to work. Um, I also talked to them about, you know, uh, what they, uh, what they care about, you know, why do they become an agent and what, what, what drives them in this business and it's 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 agents getting to the business for all sorts of different reasons just like writers are driven by very different things um and 
uh, it's, it's good to know that, um, to know again yourself, to, to know. Uh, so I told my agent, for example, that I can't really predict what I'm going to write next. Uh, I, I said, you know, I, I don't really, I'm not a good writer to build a brand around because I don't really, I don't really have one specific kind of thing that I enjoy writing. And I, I, I'm just going to turn that out all the time. That's not me. Um, I, I'm doing an epic fantasy now, but you know, when this is done, I may never do another one again. Just so, you know, that's the way I am. So if, if you, if you want to really build a brand and try to structure careers around that, I'm just not going to be a good fit. So because I knew uh, very well who I was and, and what, kind of writer I was and, and what I wanted. Um, that made it easy for me to talk to agents and try to figure out whether they would be a good fit or not. Because, you know, good agents are also really honest. They're going to say, I'm not an agent for everybody. Because you can't, you can't be a good agent for everybody. Just, it's not possible. There are writers whose styles fit the way you work and writers who don't. There are agents who are going to be excited by what you do and who are willing to follow you into whatever, wherever you go and say, hey, look, just write the thing you want to write and I will figure out how to sell it. I, I will either sell it to, you know, a, a great fantasy publisher or I'll try a mainstream publisher I'll, or I'll even do small press. Just depends on what it is you're doing. I'll, I'll try to find the best way to get your work out there. Um, other agents are very particular. They, they have very specific things that they want to do. So it's just a matter of knowing who you are and being honest about that uh, and, and then try to find the agent who will be a good match for you. I want to talk a bit about some of the specific projects that you've done, especially some of the more recent ones, because you've gone beyond just writing stories and, and expanded into different medias. Uh, you have on AMC Plus Pantheon, some of your short stories are being adapted to television shows. Um, how, where, how, did that pro or how did that opportunity come to you and how did you know that this was right for you? So, um, again, um, you know, I think my approach has always been the same, which is, a lot of these opportunities are not the sort of things where, uh, look, if you're, there are some writers who are really, really interested in writing for Hollywood. And if that's what you want to do, you kind of have to work at it. It's a very competitive field and, and you really have to dedicate yourself to getting there. And, and there are lots of professional, uh, lots of professional advice out there that you can follow on how to maximize your chances for that. Um, my approach, again, was much more patient. Um, I was very happy with what I was doing and I wanted to do the things that I wanted to do. Um, and one of the ironic things about that, though, is if you're very focused on doing the thing that you want to do and that just keep on doing that, you can, because you're so focused on the thing you want to do, you can end up becoming uh, pretty well known within that niche. Uh, and my niche was, you know, I was the only one who wrote uh, soap punk books. These are, these are books that are focused very much on technology uh, and very much on a particular aesthetic. I was the only one who wrote short stories about cryptocurrency at the time. Uh, now there are tons of people, but when I was doing it, I was the only one. Because I had these very niche things I wanted to do, I became very well known in those small circles. And that can have very interesting unintended consequences. One of the consequences was because, you know, I was very uh, specific about telling people what I wanted to do. Um, and, and I was very focused on just those three things. Readers who are dedicated to those niches know me, and they can connect me with large opportunities because they are really good fans. Uh, my opportunity to write for Star Wars event essentially came about that way. Uh, I said I was a fan of Star Wars on Twitter at one point. Somebody who really loved my work brought that up to uh, the folks who, um, you know, decide these things. Uh, and I was invited to write a short story to an anthology uh, uh, from a certain point of view, um, which is... Um, retellings of, of A New Hope, episodes from A New Hope from the perspective of characters other than the main characters. Uh, and my work there was, you know, well received. Um, and I ended up being getting, I got an offer to write a Luke Skywalker book, which was, you know, a dream come true. That was, that was amazing. So, and a lot of the TV film adaptation opportunities came about the same way. Um, my agent is the one who submits my work out. 
So I don't have a lot of insight into how that happens. Uh, all I can tell you is we we talk about which of my stories they should submit and um, what sort of uh, adaptation I would prefer and what do I have in mind? How much do I want to be involved? Things like that. After we make those decisions, the my agents then go out and and and. Um, do the submission. Uh, so I don't have a huge amount of insight into how that happens. I just know that a lot of it is dependent on the fact that I, I'm very well known in very specific niches and that word of mouth ends up being hugely helpful. Mm -hmm. So I want to pull in some audience questions here because we're getting a bunch. I want to make sure we get to as many as we can. So first question, a uh, simple question, how did you learn how to write short stories? Uh, by experimentation, really. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a very, um, so I've been to only one workshop um, and I did learn a ton from that workshop, uh, but I, I don't have a, a writing degree or anything like that. I also took a creative writing class in college uh, and that was really helpful, but that was on creative nonfiction, not on short stories per se. Um, um, I ended up uh, getting, uh, a lot of, um, I, I don't think I ever approached this in a systematic manner. I, I wasn't going about it by saying, you know, I'm going to learn how to write a short story. I'm going to read these books. I'm going to just practice the craft. It was much more experimental. Um, I, I just said, okay, here's an idea that wouldn't I let go of my brain. So maybe there's something about this idea that's interesting. Um, it, it, it's some idea it would just stick in my head for weeks, months sometimes. And eventually I just say, okay, all right, let's, let's just play with it and see what happens. Um, I'm also very happy to throw things away. So I would write, you know, a whole story and then it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel particularly interesting to me. I just throw it away. I would work on something and get halfway through it and suddenly lose interest. And that's okay. Um, if, if, if I can't seem to find the, the thing that drove me to do it in the first place, maybe it's gone forever and that's okay. Just throw it away. Um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't cost anything. You know, you're not even wasting paper these days. They're just, you're literally rearranging electrons. So who cares? Uh, so um, I, I'm a big advocate of, of playing with your words and playing with your stories, try them out. And, and if they don't, once they're on the page, if you can't see any potential in them anymore and you don't really see the point of it, just throw it away. Who cares? Um, I have, you know, I've published a hundred, 30, 150, some, somewhere around there stories by now, but I have abandoned many more and that's okay. Um, you don't need to feel guilty about trying things and abandoning them. So that's kind of how I learned. I just did a lot of it and failed a lot. Um, and uh, the ones that ended up being published were the ones that didn't fail so badly. That's basically how it worked. Next question, kind of in line with that, how did you choose where to submit your stories when you first started out? And did you develop relationships with certain editors? Yes. Um, so uh, initially, uh, this was back in the last century. Oh my God, sounds so old. Um, when I started, it was the last century. So back then you actually uh, submitted your manuscripts by mailing them out. And you actually had to include a self-addressed, self-stamped envelope so that you can get your reply back. Um, and I did that um, uh, for, for years. The way I figured out the stories that Marcus to submit to, um, I uh, used, um, I think it's called Publishers Market or something like that. I can't remember what it is. It's, it's a professional listing of all the markets that would actually, Writer's Market, that's what it was. Um, they, um, they would give you listings of all the places that accepted short stories. And I picked the ones that paid the most. That's basically it. <laughs> I thought I might as well start from the top. So I picked the ones that paid the most. Um, or the ones that I had heard of, um, or the ones that I um, actually uh, read. Uh, so if it falls into one of those three categories, um, I would submit. Um, and, uh, you know, I got rejected way more than I got accepted. Uh, but that's just part of the process. Um, and if one of the markets that I really wanted to get into didn't take it, 
So what? You just submit to the next one uh, and you just keep on going down. Uh, and if after a while everybody was saying no and you reread the story and you think it actually isn't very good anymore, uh, then you just throw it away. Uh, that's what I did. And then a follow-up to that and to your, your concept of just trying things and, and getting rid of those, have you ever recycled work that you put aside or discarded and brought it back and worked on it again? That has never happened. Um, I, I, I don't know um, why, because it seems like that would make sense. Um, I, you know, when I was writing, when you're writing a story, you often will have to cut out passages that just don't fit, but you sort of like them. So I have a separate document where I just paste stuff in there. So I don't feel like they're gone forever. Um, and because I keep on thinking I'm going to recycle and reuse them somewhere else. That has never happened. Uh, I just, um, I, I, I cut things out and they're left in these, you know, scraps files. And, and I think about reusing them, but I've never in my life gone back and actually reuse one of them. Um, I, I think that's probably for the best uh, because things get cut out for a reason, or at least eventually when you are not so enthralled in the moment, you can go back and, and look at the stuff you cut out. And, and yeah, you realize that you, you cut them out for a reason and they just don't fit anywhere else. And, uh, and that's okay. That's, that's fine. Uh, do you show your work to anyone before you send it out or do you not want editorial input from anybody? I have a trusted group of uh, critique partners uh, who I listen to. Uh, so my wife is uh, probably the most important one. Uh, she reads everything. Uh, she's the first reader for everything. Um, and uh, she gives me a very quick uh, judgment and she has actually a great system for doing this. Uh, she will read a story and then she will tell me what animal it reminds her of. Uh, and if it's an exciting animal, then I think like, yes, the story has, has legs, literally. Um, or, you know, if she doesn't think it reminds her of something great, uh, then I'll be like, okay, well, then maybe this one needs more work or maybe I should just not send this one out at all. Um, she's, she's great for giving me that kind of very uh, honest, very... Uh, quick, uh, but, but, but super important feedback. Uh, then there's a group of writers who I send stuff to, uh, cause I trust their judgment. Uh, meaning I know that they know what I'm trying to do usually in the story and they can tell me why I'm failing because the reason I don't like editorial input is because oftentimes if you are not working with the right critique partners, people will just try to turn your story into the story they want to read, which is not the same thing as the story you want to write. Um, learning how to critique and how to actually ignore feedback, um, just these are very important skills as a writer. Um, it took me years to learn how to give feedback properly, uh, which is, you know, you read the story and you give them an accurate description of the symptoms you're experiencing as you read the story. Um, and if you're gonna give any kind of suggestion, you need to give the suggestions based on what the writer is trying to accomplish, not what you would pre prefer the story to be about. Um, it, it's really hard to separate those two, um, especially early on. So, you know, being a writer in some sense is also learning how to be a useful kind of reader um, for, for this kind of purpose, because the skills you develop in figuring out what writers are really trying to accomplish and helping them to accomplish that, that's a very useful self-editing uh, technique to learn. Um, so by helping others uh, to critique their stories and helping them to write the best story that they want to write, it helps me to figure out what to do. But anyway, I have a group of friends who are excellent at telling me when I'm failing. And they'll say, look, you know, I, I know you well enough to know what you're trying to do here, uh, but this is just not working. And, and here's, here's how I'm feeling. Uh, you do do with that as you will. Um, you figure out how to solve the problem, but this is this is the problem. Mm -hmm. During the early part of your writing career, was there a point when you realized your work was publishable and how did you know? Or did you just start putting your work out there and let the journals decide? Um, you know, I, I, I think we are our own harshest critics. Um, so um, I don't think I ever thought I don't think I ever felt like my stuff was good enough. Um, so 
I'm trying to remember how I did this. I early on my process was somewhat different from how it is now. Early on, uh, I would rewrite some stories, um, you know, 20, 25 times. They, they, I mean, some of the draft numbers I have go up to into the 30s. Um, there's a lot of rewrites involved. Um, and I, it was clear that I, I didn't really, I wasn't really confident at all about what I was writing. And uh, some of these stories took me years to work on. Um, and there are some stories that just felt so important to me that I never sent them out uh, because I, I didn't want to. It's like if you're still working on them, you can still tell yourself, um, you know, I'm still working on them. But if you send them out and you get a judgment and you get a rejection, that's almost like a judgment that you 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 failed in some way. And so that was a psychological thing I had to get over. Um, I think eventually what helped me was basically I would revise, revise, revise until I got to the point where I felt like the revisions were making things worse rather than better. Um, that was basically how I knew I, I need to stop tinkering with it at that point and I'll just send it out. And if it doesn't get accepted, it doesn't get accepted. I'll have to work on something else. Uh, but that's basically my, my measure early on. I would revise, revise, get to the point where I felt like the revisions were making things worse rather than better. Um, now, of course, after many years of experience, I don't need to do that anymore. I can now generally do two drafts. I know I got to, to the point where it's pretty good. Um, but but back then, you know, it just took many, many, many revisions. And, and it, it was a very slow process of trying to figure out whether the thing that I was changing actually was making things better. And here's another question. Do you view short stories as compact versions of a novel? I ask because, or basically, do you feel like the, uh, a short story can deliver a complete sense of satisfaction or must an author always graduate from short stories to novels? Um, I, I actually don't think of them um, as one graduating to the other. I, I don't really think of them as um, degrees of the same thing. I think they're actually qualitatively entirely different creatures, short stories and novels. Um, so if I were to use an analogy, I would say short stories are like insects, whereas um, novels are really like elephants. Um, and, and the reason I say that is um, these are not just, you know, an elephant is just not a, is not just a supersized insect. It, it's not. If you take an insect and you blow up its structure to the size of an elephant, the insect would just die. Um, the exoskeleton would not be able to support the weight and uh, you would have the issue of the insect literally choking because the passive respiratory system of insects cannot function at that volume um, with the uh, surface area increasing much slower than volume. Um, so, what it means in, in practice is there's a lot of stuff that happens in novels that just don't happen in short stories. And there's a lot of stuff that works in short stories that cannot be sustained over the length of a novel. At least that's my experience. When I started to write novels rather than short stories, I had to learn an entirely different way of writing. Um, so plot, for example, is one of those things that's super, super important in the novel, but you can literally get away with not having plot in your short stories. I've written many, many, many short stories with no plot whatsoever. Um, that's just an example. There are lots of other things that you can do in the short story that you can experiment with, that you can leave the world building very sketched, sketched in rather than filled in. You can do all sorts of... Um, experimental techniques that function really well in a short story that just don't work in the novel uh, and vice versa. Lots of things you can do in the novel just that cannot work in a short story. So I would say, you know, do short stories if you're actually interested in writing short stories. I don't think short stories are particularly good as a way to practice writing novels. I mean, it wasn't for me. There were a few things that could translate, but most of the techniques I learned as a short story writer weren't particularly useful as a novelist. I had to learn a whole new set of skills anyway. Um, and if you're interested in writing novels, just write novels. I don't really see any point in um, starting out in short stories. Uh, certainly for me, that worked because my novel career was based entirely on the base of my short story career. But that is not required. And most of my novelist friends do not do things that way. So 
you don't you don't need to learn to do one to do the other. I guess is is the main point. Do you have any other examples of questions writers should ask themselves to understand who they are before they choose an agent? Okay, uh, this is actually a, a great question. Um, I think. Okay, the sort of questions that really helped me were I sat down and just asked myself, um, "What do I want an agent to、uh, to do for me?"、Um, you know, before before that,、um, I tried to learn about the agent writer、um, relationship as much of it as possible. What I did was I asked all my friends who had agents, and I asked them to give me a candid description of. What their agents did for them, and what they liked about their agents, and what they didn't like about their agents. So I learned that there are some agents who will actually tell writers exactly what to write. You know, they'll tell writers, "This is your next novel should be about this, should be aimed at this age group. This is what you would do." And there are some agents who will do none of that. And there are all agents who are anywhere in between. And there are writers who really enjoy the coaching, and writers who do not. Uh, there are agents who、um, are very, very good about selling foreign rights, and there are agents who do not care about foreign rights at all. There are agents who work really well、um, uh, collaborating with、uh, Hollywood. They collaborate with one of those big agencies to get your work out there. And there are others who prefer to work with small independent agents. And there are pros and cons to each.、Uh, I also learned that.、Um, Different agents will have very different business practices. Some agents will push really hard for a big advance for you because they believe very hard that you have to extract as much money now as possible. Other agents prefer that you not ask for a big advance, under the theory that、um, you should try to earn out as quickly as possible and then have a sustainable kind of reputation.、Um, and there are pros and cons to each. You, by asking all these questions of other writers with agents. I got a sense of what agents generally can do, the the full range of what agents can do for their authors, and how authors can empower and enable the agents to do the best work they can do. After I figure out that full range, I, I then mapped out within that full range which pieces are the ones that I wanted, where on the various scales did I want my agent to be. That. And then I just ask myself: If my agent came to me and told me, "Hey, I read your manuscript. I think you need to change this, this, and this," how I would feel? And I, I ask myself: If my agent came to me and said, "Hey,、uh, you know,、uh, middle grade uh, uh, books about wizards are really popular now.、Uh, I think you should write one." How I would feel about that? You know, I, I ask myself. These examples of things that agents have done for my friends, if if they happen to be how I would feel, that's kind of how I knew,、uh, you know, what made sense to me, what I wanted, and and what would just absolutely drive me bonkers.、Mm-hmm. Next question,、uh, Lydia Kang, another author who balances a professional career as a doctor with writing and selling multiple books and being a mother, has said that part of time management for her is just saying no to certain things. For example, watching TV. What did you say no to to find time to write in between other things when you still had a day job? Um. Wow.、Uh, I, I almost say everything. <laughs> no.、Um, When I when I was trying to do the day job as well as the writing job, I I really didn't get to play very much, unfortunately.、Um, so、uh, I didn't I missed out on several generations of consoles and games.、Uh, I just did no gaming whatsoever.、Uh, I watched no、uh, no sports.、Uh, I actually had trouble even following TV shows. I, I think there was a stretch of time where I think I got to see one TV show a year. If even that,、um, I, I really did nothing other than go to work and work on my books and spending time with the kids,、uh, and, and they were babies then. So you know, that was that was just that.、Um, so for several years there, I was not doing anything fun at all, quote unquote,、um, and that was that was pretty tough and not really sustainable. I think that's also when I decided that I need to figure out a way to to.、Um, 
make things work better for me. I mean, now I definitely make room in my schedule to pursue all the things I want to do. Uh, so, for example, I um, I get to spend a lot of time uh, playing games with my kids. Uh, I get to spend a lot of time um, uh, modding video game consoles, which is a thing that I really enjoy doing uh, and could not do before. Um, and uh, I say no to lots of things, uh, uh, invitations to um, speak, teach, uh, contribute stories, whatnot. Uh, and I have the luxury of actually saying no. I mean, again, you know, you have to understand this a trade-off. By saying no to lots of things, you're also saying no to a lot of money. Um, so you just have to decide how much of that you you really want and, and how much you're willing to give up. But to me, um, time with my kids is so much more important uh, than, you know, another trip somewhere to, to give a speech uh, that I'd rather not do with the money. Um, so that's, that's how it is. Mm -hmm. Where were the stories published that agents took notice of and how many had you published at that time? By the time agents started coming to me, I think I had somewhere between 20 to 40 stories out. Um, certainly enough for a collection. That's when agents actually pay attention to you because if you just have a few, it's not, it's just not worth it for them. Uh, you know, you, you can't do a book. Um, they were published in all the top genre magazines at the time. I think at the time uh, they were in Asimov's, uh, Clark's World, uh, Strange Horizons, um, Fantasy and Science Fiction, um, Analog. Uh, they were in all the top um, sci-fi fantasy magazines. Um, and uh, I was nominated or had won uh, a bunch of genre awards that, that also helped. Uh, so, you know, awards definitely help. Uh, I'm not going to ever, you know, uh, not acknowledge that they are very important, even though I, I, I do agree that awards in general are a very flawed way to measure something. Um, but there's no doubt that they were very helpful to my career. Might be our last question, but you, you speak about asking writer friends about agents early in your career. How did you network when you were just starting out? Did you join writers groups, go to conventions? Um, yeah, you know, I didn't go out specifically with the aim of networking. Um, I tended to do things that felt interesting to me. So, for example, um, early on when I was learning to write, um, I... Uh, I found those really helpful for folks exchange manuscripts. Now, because it's online, it means that a lot of times uh, you're going to have to uh, accept that many, um, many of the folks who comment on your manuscript are not going to be your type of writer. Um, so you just have to learn how to filter out the feedback that you did that's not really helpful to you. But I also got to make some lifelong friends as a result of doing that. You know, several of my friends um, came out of those online critique groups. Um, and, uh, so that's one way to do it. Uh, when you attend those critique groups, people will also introduce you over time to, um, other writers groups, writers forums, um, online discussion groups, and also in person, um, uh, conventions and meetings. Um, I really enjoy going to in-person conventions at the local level, writers uh, conventions, writers festivals, um, things like that, because you can meet a lot of folks who are at the same level as you and, and who um, can share tips with you and, and, and can encourage you. Um, it, it was very helpful to me to go to these things and feel not so alone. I, I like to feel like I was in something that other people have done and are doing. So um, nothing that I was doing was, was so weird that I couldn't uh, find somebody to sympathize with me. Um, so that was very helpful. I, I did find that very, very helpful. Let's see if we can get one more question in here. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, now that you only write, you don't have a day job. What is your writing schedule like? Um, it's actually super relaxed. Um, so um, I spend about uh, two days a week uh, just focused on uh, my children's schooling uh, because we homeschool. So I spend two days a week just focused on that. Um, the rest of the time, I um, try to spend maybe the mornings 
uh, uh, doing writing, and then the afternoon was handling the business aspects, uh, contracts and revisions and negotiations and things like that. Um, and that's pretty much it. I, I try not to. Uh, I mean, honestly, if you you can't spend at least I can't I can't spend eight hours a day writing. I, I find that I'm not very productive. I try to do that. Um, if I get a couple of thousand words out, that's very good as a day of productivity. Uh, and uh, after that, I just try to um, handle all the other parts of the business that are not so um, uh, demanding of my mental energy. Um, also, you know, I, I do a lot of public speaking, so I spend a lot of time uh, speaking with organizers, preparing agendas, uh, preparing presentations, things like that. So that's my schedule. Um, the writing is uh, probably three days a week and only in the mornings. Mm -hmm. So before I let you go, is there anything, any parting advice or anything you didn't get a chance to talk about today that you were really wanting to talk about? Um, let me see. Um, well, I do want to mention that uh, the conclusion to my epic fantasy series, um, the Dungeon Dynasty is coming out this year and next. Uh, it's, it's, I wrote the concluding volume as one volume, but it turned out to be so long that they had to break it into two books. So the first half is coming out this November and the second half is coming out next year. Um, and I'm super excited. Uh, you know, I said, it took me more than 10 years to finish the series. And it's just really exciting to see uh, the whole thing uh, come together. And, come out. and as far as parting words of wisdom, I don't have any wisdom, uh, but I, I do have experience. And I will say based on my experience, um, uh, look, you know, no one can tell you how to be a writer because everybody's journey is different. So if people tell you this is the way you have to do it, that's, nonsense. Um, there are lots of ways to do what you want to do, lots of ways to get there. You can do it fast or slow. You can do it um, uh, by really dedicating yourself and throw yourself 100% into it, or you can do it the way I did, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as a slow burn, as a side gig until you get to the point where you can do it full time. If there are 100 writers, there are 100 different journeys. Embrace your own journey trust that you're going to get to where you want to be if you keep on doing the things that drive you and, and make you excited. Mm -hmm. That's it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, all of your books and your upcoming projects to all of our listeners, I'm going to include links in the show notes to that. So if you're looking to, for where to find those, uh, just wait for the email or for the show to be posted. It will be there. Ken, is there any, how can people find you? Where are you on the internet? You had social media? Oh Yeah. So um, I use Twitter, uh, but not, I'm not very active there. I just post announcements there. So you can follow me on Twitter. It's K-Y-L-I-U-99. Uh, you can also find me on my website, which is kenlu.name, although you can do kenlu.com. It will go to the same place. But the canonical name is kenlu.name. Ken, thank you so much for being here. This has been a, an awesome discussion. And to thank all you so much for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, to all of our listeners, we're back next week. Uh, same time, same place. We're talking to Aaron Mankey. So we'll see you then.